to the Film Library of Canopy podcast. My name is Daniel Thompson. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Alonzo Duraldi. Alonzo, how you doing, sir? I'm doing excellent, and uh, I, I feel like I should be in black and white today. That's right. But, uh, you know, or, or at least it shouldn't be so dang sunny. But I made a, what, what are you going to do? I made a terrible decision three years ago, and it's led to this moment. Uh, that's all I know. <laughs> and, and, and that moment is us getting to talk on Canopy, about Canopy and their titles, but also about the genre film noir, which is, yeah. I mean, classic. Just, just when you say the word classic, you, you really think of film noir. At least I do. Absolutely. Uh, film noir has an interesting history, like a lot of uh, aspects of American um, feature films. You can trace the it back to German expressionism and the sort of the use of shadow and darkness. Um <clears throat> It, that originally sort of influenced the kind of universal horror films of the 1930s. And then you get to the 40s during and after World War II especially, and that same mood is is coming into sort of detective movies or these kind of bleak thrillers. Um, and a lot of the people who created German Expressionism as directors, cinematographers, you see present in these films, including Billy Wilder, whose film Double Indemnity is mm. considered to be really, you know, the, one of the ones that, that really kind of kicks this off. I found a great definition of the genre for people who don't know. Obviously, film noir in French literally means black film or dark film. Uh, but uh, as, as uh, David Cook says, these were films which carried post-war American pessimism to the point of nihilism yeah. by assuming the absolute and irredeemable corruption of society and of everyone in it. And that pretty much captures it. That's what we're talking about Yippee! Here. Super sunshiny. <laughs> and I will say, for a film layman like myself, when you say film noir, I think of Billy Wilder and I think of Humphrey Bogart in The Maltese mm. Falcon. That's what I think of. Sure. But it goes so much further than that, and and as you said, especially after World War II, film noir launches what amounts to be a thousand ships moving forward. The, the genre extends into present day with neo-noir and all kinds of themes that you see repeated that really got their start all the way back in film noir. Absolutely. So yeah, th this is kind of the, uh, you know, you're seeing the American film industry maturing in a way, because I think, especially once the production code kicks in in the 30s, there's a lot of upbeat optimism and can do and, you know, musicals or whatever. And these are movies that are really asking questions about society, about just the choices that, that, that America has made collectively, that people make on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it kind of taps into you know, this is the era where you're starting to see these sort of semi-documentary, almost kind of problem movies, you know, things like A Gentleman's Agreement that are sort of dealing with aspects of American society that maybe need improvement. It's also coming out of the Italian neorealists where they're, you know, very fly on the wall and capturing stuff as it happens. So these are movies that are, are really asking the tough questions, but at the same time, they're very entertaining and they're thrilling. Um, you know, a lot of hard-boiled detectives, a lot of um, femme fatale, That's which right. is kind of a weirdly gendered thing. I was thinking about that this morning, that in a noir film, you know, if a man meets a duplicitous woman, like, that's the plot. <laughs> Whereas if a woman meets a duplicitous man, that's just Tuesday, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you know, you you get these, um, these sort of interesting explorations of what's happening in American society and, how, you know, where, where are we going and and what's it doing to us on a, on a basic level. And so there are a lot of really great films that come out of this period. And of course, Canopy offers so many of them. Uh, I would say if you if you're, if you're getting your feet wet, start with a movie called detour. Mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, uh, you know, I think absolutely kind of lays out the groundwork for what these films are, which is uh, it's a it's a road picture. You know, it's a guy who's got dreams of a better life and he's going across country. He picks up the wrong woman hitchhiker and it just goes downhill from there for everybody. Um, but it is so terse in a way like this is a movie that has no fat on it it it, it, it uses its low budget to its benefit and so it, it just it's just one thing after another and it is this beautifully bleakly psychological portrait of two people on a spiral it's that stark contrast that i think makes film noir so incredibly special it's it's hard-boiled it's gritty it's dark it's i made one mistake and everything's falling apart but also it's usually very beautiful to look at the these are very beautiful Absolutely. images and you can find those on canopy we 
We also have a great guest today, Alonzo, who's going to help unpack a little bit more of what you can find on Canopy for Film Noir and just about the genre in general. I can't wait to hear what he has to say, Alonzo, about Film Noir. Justin Chang from The New Yorker is joining us, uh, and the, this is a guy that you want to go to with any film questions, really, and so I'm thrilled that he's going to be joining us, so stick around. It'll be right after this break. Here's the Film Library trivia question for today. This 2001 film originally started as a TV pilot and was heavily influenced by the 1950 film Sunset Boulevard. Think you know the answer? Find out after this interview. Welcome back to the Film Library, a Canopy podcast, joined as always by Alonzo Duraldi. We have an exciting guest today, Alonzo, to talk to us about film noir. Take it away, Alonzo. So thrilled to have with us. Uh, he covers the waterfront literally from coast to coast. You know him from the his w- years of work at the Los Angeles Times. He is now uh, gracing the pages of the New Yorker magazine, and he is the co-president of the National Society of Film Critics. Justin Chang, welcome wow. to the Film Library, a Canopy podcast. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you for having me, Alonzo and Daniel. Good to be good to be back with you. What Thank a get you. for us! I got to be honest. I didn't even that, that yeah. the, the film society. Oh my goodness, we're yeah, doing season that. one. We're 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 killing it here. So, uh, so <laughs> film noir. Uh, we were talking a little in the intro about how it's, it very much reflects a sort of post war American mood of questioning, uh, uh, you know, uh, society and and institutions. Uh, but obviously, it's a genre that has emerged uh, or that has you know continued to the present day. So whatever it was, whatever buttons it, buttons it was pushing in the 40s, you know, it, 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 we're still finding ways into it in the 21st century. Uh, what are your thoughts about just the genre as a whole and, and, and how it plays into the history of cinema? Yeah, it's funny because I've often thought about it correctly or incorrectly as a genre, but I know many people disagree because it is something that is so tied specifically to the 1940s in particular and talking about kind of mid-war, but post-war noir, especially becoming such a force. And obviously the feelings of just, uh, of darkness and cynicism and disillusionment and despair <laughs> that kind of underlie that very much tied to, to, uh, to World War II. Um, although it raises the question of how much, um, are, are we being too quick sometimes to read World War II into every movie that was, you know, made during that time? It's a, it's an open question, but, but because it is like, say, unlike, the Western or the musical, which are kind of self-explanatory, noir is so specific, and it's this. We think of it so much as an American thing, but the it, you know film noir is is a is a French coinage, of course, you know, and and its its roots are in German expressionism. So it's like it is this kind of pan-cultural sort of um, sort of form that uh, it, it is a genre, and in some ways is is not. Be, but then at the same time, Alonso, as you're saying because it has persisted and because it has endured and thrived and we see contemporary versions of it and we i guess we call it neo noir now um and at, you know at what point is do the neo noirs of the present become classic noirs of, of themselves but true yeah i think that um it's i think it's a it's good to treat it as a very elastic definition. I, I, I certainly do. Um, and it's sometimes I think of it as more a style and a, a matter of mood and tone than, than a genre unto itself. And yet, you know, um, it's just so funny too, though, but for me, noir was really formative. I mean, when I was first falling in love with movies, it was a genre that I went to gravitated toward much more so than I think anything else. Um, and so that's a sign of just how how versatile uh, the form is, how many great directors were working in it. And it's funny, yeah, thinking about just, I, I was thinking in, in preparation for this conversation about recent noirs that I love. Um, you know, it's it's kind of funny, and not, not that these, I'm not ready to necessarily in, introduce these to the canon right now, but since we're thinking in, in terms of like modern times, or recent cinema, I was just thinking about, you know, Love Lies Bleeding, Rose Glass's film is very much a noir mm. of its moment. And, you know, sure. uh, you know, a uh, kind of lesbian boxing revenge noir, you know, uh, which is classic. Uh, multiple, multiple <laughs> subgenres. Oh, that old song. <laughs> that old song. <laughs> I mean, multiple subgenres within this overarching uh, uh, genre or style. And another one that I love from uh, a few years ago is actually Park Chan-wook's decision to leave. Mm. Uh, 
Oh, totally. you know, so yeah. good. Thinking, thinking more internationally too, and and God knows I'm I'm not as as versed in in that as I am with, as as most of us are with with Hollywood noir and American noir. But um, this is it is something that transplants so readily into uh, different countries, different cultures, and cinemas. So <laughs> yeah, uh, Li, Li Chang Dong's Burning, which is you know currently screening on Cameo or on Canopy, is absolutely I think uh, a, a film that encapsulates that mood of. Doom, <laughs> you know, that we that we associate well, with noir, but in a very contemporary, very Korean context. Very much so. And oh god, I kept you and that is like one of my favorite movies, let alone noir mm, yeah. of recent years. And I hadn't actually even thought about it in those terms, but it absolutely is. Um and you know, based on a, a Murakami short story of all things, and yet we recognize in because it's a crime story and it's about lost men and lost women or one lost woman in that case, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's, yeah, the, the tropes of those things, you know, the persist, you know, we, we think about a man on this solitary journey, you know, through the shadows, we think about the femme fatale, um, or, you know, and these are, these are devices that just recur. And yet in a way, I don't know, it's funny, noir itself has become something, it's almost a little re reductive to think of the, about those things. And yet, those tropes do. There they are. Yeah. There you, they are. You touched on, <laughs> you just touched on something I wanted to ask further about with neo-noir and we look at movies that are made now and we could very easily go, well, these are shot in color and they have themes that cinema has drawn on for forever. What particularly is, is, is tying them to neo-noir versus just cinema? Yeah. In the sense, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's kind of funny when I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking actually back to when around the time it was deep into my my love of film, but I was really starting to you know I was in college when both Memento and Mulholland Drive came out that storied year of two thousand and one, um, which is um, which is a great year, um, and I was thinking out here are two you know um, two movies and two you know two directors um, you know Christopher Nolan and David Lynch. Who have you know? And Lynch has been kind of plumbing this territory for a while now, and, and always does. Whereas, and Nolan has kind of moved past it into different, different things. But there's something about that two kind of great LA movies that have very little in common stylistically with what we think of as classic noir. With you know, obviously as you said, Daniel shot in color among other things, doing really interesting things with structure and and in a way, what what I love about both these movies and and I think the format in which they're in, if we think of them as noir, and it's certainly not the only way to think about these two movies, but is that it's 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 a very accommodating kind of vessel noir is in a way for a filmmaker's particular obsessions and predilections in a way. Um, noir is something a lot of classic film noir does play around with chronology, you know, and and often you know the device we think of you know, we think we think of. Double Indemnity, um, you know, one of my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite movies ever still. And, you know, just a, a device that we think of as very common nowadays where, you know, the, prota the protagonist is sort of, you know, is dragging himself into this room and, and narrating the story that we're about to hear. You know, you're, you're, you're probably wondering how I got here. You know, <laughs> the, the, 19, the 1944 version of, of what, what that, whatever that joke is. Um, but it's like, we think of that as so common now, but in a way, that was not the most common thing back then. And, and uh, film noir kind of destabilized that in a way because it's it's like, well, oh yeah, how, you know, the fatalism of it, you know, you know this is going to end badly. And in a way, the destination, that overshadows even just how the whole how we got here thing. And then, but then and with Memento or something, which I do think of as a great neo-noir, it's like Nolan is kind of like shaking that up. And then you have, you know, Lynch who is just, you know, kind of recasting it in, as sort of in this sort of, feminist dream language that is also kind of a, a, a commentary on, on Hollywood itself and um, and using this kind of Nancy Drew mystery format. So one, I, I should say too, my love of noir really evolved along my love of mysteries, my love of detective mm -hmm. novels. And what's always really spoken to me about it is that I think that um, it's just been really great to see directors kind of how do you handle the challenges of just a very intricately structured thing that in some ways can be more intricate on the page and must be more so 
you know, you talk about how does how I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place here, but this is um, but like, how does, you know, how does Howard Hawks juggle the insane plot of the of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep? Uh, he can't really. And it's like, and it doesn't matter. That movie is great. famously, famously, Raymond Chandler did not know uh, who committed one murder in any way. So but I've always been kind of fascinated by how cinema takes, um, you know, something as 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 formulaic, but also as pleasurable as kind of the classic you know, detective story and turns that in and, and darkens it and, and makes art out of it and, 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 and follows a template, but transcends it at the same time. And, and I think often you get like these really nihilistic noirs, whether it's, you know, um, uh, kiss me deadly or, or a neo noir like Chinatown where the detective is not only helpless to sort of solve the crime, but is perhaps in some ways making it worse, uh, by sort of like, you know, b- b- two fisting his way through these situations. And so there is this kind of thing of like, what if we had a murder mystery or a, you know, a, a sort of classic mystery unfolding, but there was no point in trying to solve it because alt- at the end of the day, we're just all doomed anyway. And, and there's, there's no getting over that, you know? Yeah. That sense of fatalism, which is such a, a, a part of the root appeal of these movies and they don't all end unhappily, of course, but that is true. Sure. But I think classically though, Alonzo, we do think of it that way. And we think of out of the past and, and, yeah. and double indemnity and, and kiss me deadly and, or, or even something like, um, I mean, it's kind of, atypical in the sense that it's not as much of a it's it, it i think departs more from conventions but i think of even like nicholas ray's in a lonely place where mm. there um and that's kind of this heartbreakingly sad story of, of a union of a, a, a relationship that is unraveled by the end right. and it doesn't it doesn't end as violently as um as 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 some of the films we've been discussing but it's it's quite devastating and there is a sense of just this inevitability to it as well like this will not end well uh, yeah, I mean, C- Canopy has the original DOA, which I think in a lot of ways is this <laughs> ultimate noir, and that that you know at the beginning that the hero is dying, <laughs> and the only thing left for him to do is to solve his own murder before he inevitably dies. Yeah. Not a spoiler, you know, they tell you right away <laughs> he is doomed, and there's nothing you can do to fix it. The only thing you can do is at least try and find some sense of justice by by fingering the killer uh, along the way in all of this. Isn't it funny, too, when I, I remember watching DOA years ago and then thinking to I could be wrong about this and I apologize if I am but wasn't that the inspiration for the crank movies the with Jason Statham <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, you know, like, has, like maybe I, 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 I thought of the crank movies as coming out of speed basically where like if yes. his heart beats under 55 you know, <laughs> exactly right. uh, it's but, kind of like this I, mix of speed and DOA in a way and, and then of sure. course but then there have been like sequels right so which is you know, yeah a know, lot of so sense like, yeah the world of crank is starting to unravel yeah. for us a little bit which is wild <laughs> it made but, so much uh, sense before <laughs> the crank cinematic universe which but no it's it is also in its own funny way another reminder of just how um how enduring noir is and how it can take you know um these uh even more kind of debased kind of, you know, uh Iterations. Well, know, it, so. the, you know, noir is a vehicle for trauma in a lot of ways. The, the genre is. And I, you, you talked about how we kind of make it about World War II and the disillusionment. Do you think that COVID and what we went through will have a similar filmmaking effect on what we're going to see in currently and, and in the years to come on possibly what, what film's going to look like for the remainder of the decade? That's a really interesting question. I I don't know. It's funny because it's, you know, there, and you know, filmmakers are still making lockdown ish movies. Uh, I think Olivia Assayas just made one, <laughs> which I, which I need to see. Um, but it's but I know you might be asking Daniel about not even just in a in a COVID you know situational kind of sense, but actually just the despair fostered mm-hmm. by the pandemic and how that might uh, seep into the kinds of movies. I, I don't know. I, there, there probably are examples already, and there I, I don't have many that are coming to mind, but just, you know, noir is so much a, uh, the kind of typical story is one of isolation, right? In, in, a, in a spiritual sense, not necessarily a physical one. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we may yet see that. I think that, um, I, in a weird way, it's funny because I do feel like 
filmmaking in general is trying to move past that and nobody wants to see a crappy you know uh <laughs> pandemic <laughs> shut down shut down movie again uh, except you know I, I actually never say never but you know for the most part what came out of that was not great by and large but um well, but it's look, interesting I, do, I do think there is i do think there's a mood right now though that lends itself to this kind of storytelling because it is so easy to be despairing about where we are in late stage capitalism <laughs> and where we are in the global sense in terms of whatever victories occurred over fascism or you know on behalf of the middle class in the 20th century are battles we have to have again and and so yeah i, I think there is that unease and distrust that loans itself to noir storytelling that exists in the in the in the gener in the water right now yeah. sam esmail's leave the world behind I, I when i watched that movie it felt like okay. a movie that i i felt like we were going to see for the next 10 years like a movie that 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 template was going to be revisited over and over again moving out of what we just went through it's entirely possible yeah <laughs> yeah things that you know the, the apocalypse in general is is forever uh, an evergreen subject, you know. And, and I was that tilts into different things like like disaster movie making, but also, you know, when things are sort of more stripped down and intimate, um, it's uh, yeah, it, it's kind of funny. I this is I, I'll met, I'll throw out a movie that I don't love and I don't think many people love, but that's uh, but it is worth talking about in this context, and that's Under the Silver Lake, um, David Robert Mitchell's. Mm. Uh, 2018 kind of reinvention, you know, and, and it's funny because that movie is in some ways just a dive into its own cinematic navel and which abounds in references <laughs> for their own sake. And I, I don't say that completely, you know, uh, disparagingly. I think it's I, I, I kind of like the movie a little more than a lot of people do, even though I agree it's it's massively indulgent. Um, but it commits know, to what it is. For sure. <laughs> it commits to what it is in its own oddity. And it's it's sort of I, I think, though, that there is something about that movie that did capture, and this was pre-COVID, but something of just like this idea that we are surrounded by signifiers of meaning that may or may, may be signifying everything, which is the same thing as saying they're signifying nothing. And so, so it's kind of like what it, it is in some ways about <laughs> the excess and therefore the just complete paucity of meaning. And it's there's something really, you know, and the movie is very goofy and funny and snarky and, 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 and witty in some ways. But there is something really kind of scary about that. You know, the it's if this is all about kind of existential unease, this idea that um, as we, you know, plunging down the rabbit hole and. <laughs> What if there's just no there or there? I don't know. <laughs> I, no, and I can see that being a movie that ages well and that, that we sort of are able to more easily embrace for what it's saying. I, I was thinking about in terms of neo-noir, I think a big turning point is when Robert Altman makes The Long Goodbye and casts Elliot Gould as, uh, you know, um, Philip Marlowe and how at the time there were just people thought, what, how dare you? This is, you know, Bogart and Dick Powell and blah, blah. But with the, with the, you know, 50 years or so later, it's as much of a kind of look at a classic Hollywood that no longer exists as it was in its own time. And so I think that distance kind of allows us to perceive what it's doing and how it fits into this traditional mode that, that contemporary viewers would think that it was, you know, too far afield. And so, yeah, I could see the same thing with under the silver Lake being something that it, as, as the world catches up to it and it seems less crazy, you know, that, that you, you're able to sort of pick out the how he's nailing that specific, you know, late 2010s mood in the way that something like, you know, a DOA or whatever, like nails that late 40s mood, even if we can still watch it today and perceive it, you know, on its own merits. I think it's such a great example to I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the long goodbye, which it kind of t sort of goes to what I was saying about just what a filmmaker really makes this takes a template and makes it their own, you know, mm -hmm. because I think of the long goodbye as one of the great noirs too. And yet it is so atypical in so many ways because it's, it, it's funny, it's shaggy, it's charming. And Elliot Gould is a, is a Philip Marlowe, very different from the ones we've seen. And it must've seen, yeah, seemed, you know, sacrilegious at the time in terms of just how the complete lack of pretension in that, you know, and now though it's, it's just, it's wonderful. And it, it feels like both, a kind of shaggy slice of life, but it also has this, you know, this it's it's LA, it's the it's the underbelly of Los Angeles, it's the it's the doominess of it, you know, all of that. 
Um, I have to say really quickly, too, while I'm on this, in some ways, one of the first noir films I saw, if it even fits the bill, is not the original classic, The Big Sleep, which I've seen countless times and adore, but the the Robert Mitchum the Robert Mitchum <laughs> one, which is not fondly, it was on TV, and it was like, and it was, it is not fondly remembered as all, even at, at all, even though Mitchum is, you know, objectively a great Marlowe yeah, yeah. casting. But it's like, <clears throat> but it was so, it was just like, what? I, I was very young, probably way too young to be watching. The movie, but I was like, what? Is this? <laughs> but even then. You know, it's still, I mean, this is me, you know, very young movie girl watching this, but it retains this fascination, I think, just because <clears throat> there is just something eternally fascinating about the story that it's telling. So, well, yeah. And I think, you know, with a lot of the 70s noirs, it's sort of like, oh, really, post-World War II malaise? Hold my beer and let me tell you about Vietnam and Watergate and the Manson family, you know, we're also kind of feeling it. It's you know? almost so, like there's yeah. always a time where we can feel really, really <laughs> crummy about stuff. <laughs> uh, one, would, one would think that history was cyclical in that way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. As long as there is trauma of some kind, as long as there are wars, no. I mean, and you're absolutely right that this moment will produce its own uh, beyond just COVID. It, but it's so funny, right? Because I think so many of us watching these older films, which are reflective, the 40s and 50s noirs in particular, which are reflective of the turmoil of the eras in which they were produced. But now we look at them, and there isn't, of course, we look to them as escapist entertainment, not only, but, you know, this was. You know, I was watching, you know, Otto Preminger's Laura, which is one of my favorites, too. Like, and I was this was just this was fun for me. And it's like and that is actually in some ways less not as um, fatalistic and doomy and noir. It actually has something of a happy ending, even though it's got all sorts of weird necrophilia like kind of um, <laughs> undertones as well to it. But it's you know, it's it's actually kind of a relatively, um, you know, more of a, a, a more of a whodunit in some ways, um, a tidy whodunit than, than some others. But um, and it is interesting to think that these movies and this form change and how we react to them changes. And there's something that's actually kind of exciting and I think hopeful about that. He, um, yeah. He's Justin Chang, among other things. He's a film critic for The New Yorker. Justin, thanks for joining us to talk a little film noir and uh, be best of luck and wishes to you along the way, sir. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> time to find out today's film library trivia question answer if you guessed the 2001 movie mulholland drive you were correct welcome back to the film library a canopy podcast justin chang alonzo what a national treasure that guy is I'm telling you, uh, you know, he is, he knows so much about so much. Uh, there are any, any number of topics that I will corner him on and like, oh, what about blah, blah, blah. And he'll just, he'll know things and he'll give me titles and suggestions and have really great insights. So thrilled, thrilled beyond compare that we could get the best. I loved hearing him kind of splice apart like the genre, especially as it relates to neo-noir. He mentioned mm -hmm. one of my all time favorite movies, Memento, Christopher Nolan's Memento. You can find it on Canopy. Uh, this movie, first of all, has this, you know, throughout the film, which I don't want to give away the structure, but chronology is a huge part of it, but it goes black and white and goes into narration. And so mm -hmm. Nolan is doing this wonderful thing in this movie that really demands several viewings, like a lot of his movies do, where occasionally he puts you in a completely different time period and he narrates for someone who that appears to be, uh, you know, knowing of something that we don't know. And you, you have to put right. together why that's the case. And in it, and it plays so well in a noir structure. You have a Carrie Ann Moss that is she a femme fatale or not? We don't know. You have a character that is has a missing piece to the puzzle because his life completely changed uh, at the beginning of this movie because of a major incident. So it's another big component of uh, of film noir, and it's it's put together in a puzzle box that Nolan reveres in his movies. And it's a movie that I saw when I was 18, 19 years old the first time, actually 20 when it came out, and then I, I and I read revisited it and on every upon every revisit revisitation it's a movie that holds some fun treasures for me and so i think when i think of neo noir that's the movie that i think of because it was so formative for me as a 20 year old person that knew nothing about movies 
<laughs> well, yeah, it, it absolutely, I think, you know, br brought a lot of those tropes to a new audience who, who were not familiar with them. And so what's cool about Canopy is that, yes, you can see the more recent examples that sort of are carrying on the tradition, but also take it all the way back to the beginning. And they've got some really great 40s and 50s titles. I mentioned DOA, which is wonderfully bleak and, and, and worth watching. Detour, which I feel like is in a lot of ways just sort of the quintessential oh, yeah. Uh, noir film, no question. Um, also, uh, The Hitchhiker from 1953, directed by the great Ida Lupino, one of the few uh, women filmmakers of the mid-20th century who was working independently outside of the studio system. Like, Dorothy Arzer was kind of the one woman making movies for studios until, like, the late 60s or so. But uh, Lupino, on her own, um, you know, finding funding and doing these really, like, you know, again... I think you know you can you can use uh, noir you can use a low budget to your to your benefit when you're doing a noir film because you get you're shooting on location you're not kind of faking it in these sound stages and so it gives you a, a, a real grit which again takes you to the the Italian neorealist place um, and, and kind of puts you into these roadhouses these cars these dives these detectives offices with the light coming through the you know the 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 Venetian blinds or whatever. So, you know, the, the Hitchhiker is really great. Um, the Blue Gardenia, which is, you know, um, uh, one of the, the, you know, the great Alan Ladd films of that period. Sudden Fear, Joan Crawford, and a very young Jack Palance. Um, the Strange Love of Martha Ivers, which is where Kirk Douglas's career kicks off. And you've got Barbara Stanwyck, who is, you know. She's Barbara Stanwyck. The, Come on. One of the queens of noir. I mean, you know, among so many other things that she's so great at. Um, you know, and and then, but again, you know, we, we're talking about international. So obviously you've got Brighton Rock, which is, you know, uh, from the UK. And then as we get into the neo-noirs, um, you know, we, we you, know, you can kick that off with, with Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, mm -hmm. um, which he is, you know, his tribute to monogram pictures and to old gangster movies, you know. Jean-Paul Beaumondo's lead character is obsessed with Bogart and sort of like trying to model himself on it, you know, doing dressing in a way or behaving in a way that he thinks is very kind of Bogartian. So there's a lot of, of noir influence there. Uh, Le Samurai, which uh, with uh, Alain Delon, which... Uh, is a film that is, you know, the, is Jean-Pierre Melville very much inspired by Hollywood noir. And then that film would go on to be a big inspiration to John Woo um, in his early Hong Kong films, which a lot of times also are carrying the, the sort of noir thing of the hard-bitten detective and, and the femme fatale and whatnot. So th there's a real, you know, like I said, there, the history is cyclical. <laughs> there's a through line with these films inspiring other ones. Uh, I'm a big fan of Croupier. Uh, with Clive Owen, where he plays a novelist who goes to work as a croupier in a casino just to sort of, you know, take in the ambience and look for ideas for, for writing. And, of course, you know, gets in way too deep, as as a classic noir hero does. Uh, and, in fact, even a remake of Brighton Rock from 2010. So Canopy's got a ton of choices if you're looking for old school OG noirs if you're looking for you know the movies they inspired if you're looking for the movies that were inspired by the movies that were inspired by the movies that originally came out of noir it's an enduring uh, genre or 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 motif however you want to look at noir um, that that really does kind of take you through so much of cinema and canopy just has so much of it for you to look all at. with just a library card Alonzo over 30,000 right. titles there's plenty of TV you can find that has noir elements mm -hmm. in it as well. All right yeah. there with a library card at canopy.com. Obviously, the titles are going to vary by location and by country, but there's plenty to find anytime you want to turn on Canopy. It's right there for you. That's right. So, you know, it, it, why go to film school? You know, <laughs> you've, got, you've got Canopy for free. They're gonna, you're going to see all the films that, that uh, a well-meaning professor like myself or Justin would want to show you. Uh, and, you know, the, the, you really does allow you to kind of connect the dots for, uh, for the history of cinema, the people who made, you know, extraordinary films and, and how those films went on to influence so many other great artists. Absolutely. Uh, Canopy is a place to find all of this and so much more, whether it be film noir or one of the other great genres that we've covered here on the Film Library. You can find that all at Canopy.com. We thank you so much for listening. And uh, until we meet again, go watch something. <laughs>